As we continue our Lenten walk to Jerusalem with Jesus, we focus in on the disciple Jesus loved in John 19, verses 26 and 27. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to his disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. This is the word of God for the people of God. If you've been here with us during this Lenten season, you know we are doing a sermon series about watching our Lord die. And we're looking at some pivotal, pivotal characters uh, in this drama. Uh, the first Sunday we looked at Ju Judas Iscariot, and last Sunday we looked at Joseph of Arimathea. And today we're looking at the beloved disciple of Jesus. Most scholars would say that this beloved disciple is John, John the evangelist, John the author of the fourth uh, gospel, uh, John the one who wrote the three letters toward the end of the New Testament, and John the one who was last to die and wrote the book of Revelation from the island of Patmos. In the fourth gospel, uh, the term the beloved disciple was used six times. Uh, this morning, I'm going to just look at four of those occasions, one at the Last Supper, one at the scene of the crucifixion, which you just heard, one at the empty tomb, and one at the resurrection scene of the miraculous catch of fish, again, all coming from the Gospel of John. Let us pray. How good it is to feel the fellowship of this body, O oh Lord, to know how strong we can be when we unite in the Spirit of Jesus Christ. May we look this morning at the one that you called the beloved disciple. Teach us what that designation meant to you and what it means to us today. Amen. Well, let's go to the Last Supper, uh, and especially to the 13th chapter of John, uh, and beginning with the 23rd verse. And it states, Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom, one of his disciples, whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter, therefore, mentioned to him to ask who it was of whom he spoke. Peter asked the beloved disciple, the, when Jesus said, one of you will betray me. Then leaning back, according to Scripture, on Jesus' breast, the Lord said to him, or John said to him, Lord, who is it? So John was reclining at the table, leaning on Jesus' bosom. John was the only one to be so close to the Lord that he could hear Jesus' very heartbeat. While the others were arguing over who would be first in the kingdom, John was leaning on Jesus' breast. All the others could see themselves and, and one another. All John could see was Jesus. While Peter was making promises that he would not be able to keep in terms of how faithful he would be to Jesus until death, John, John was leaning on Jesus' breast. While Jesus was counting his money, John was leaning on Jesus' bosom. While some were finding fault that fateful night, 
John was leaning on Jesus' breast while the others listened to themselves and one another John was feeling the very breath of our Lord listening to his heartbeat feeling the warmth of his love how close do you draw to the Lord there's a contemporary Christian song that some of you know out of our faith we sing it's a simple one Jesus draw me close closer Lord to you let the world around me fade away Jesus draw me close closer Lord to you for I desire to worship and obey that was written by Rick Founds worship leader of Sunrise Christian Fellowship in Fallbrook California he also wrote the song Lord I lift your name on high it was early on Easter Sunday morning and according to John the 20th chapter Mary Magdalene discovers Jesus' tomb is empty and she hurries back to tell the disciples and the beloved disciple and Peter immediately spring up and race to the tomb the beloved disciple is the first one to reach the tomb, although Peter is the first one to enter. During one of Jesus' resurrection appearances, and this comes out of the 21st chapter of the Gospel of John, beginning at the fourth verse, it says, Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not recognize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, Friends, have you caught any fish? They answered him, No. Cast your net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because there were so many fish in it. 153 to be exact. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord! So after his death, seven of them have returned to doing what they knew best, fishing. And at dawn they look and see a man on the shore, but they can't make out who it is. And after following this man's fishing tip, and they try to haul in all the fish in their net, no one knows more immediately without seeing for themselves who it was. It was the one that leaned on Jesus' breast, who could hear his very heartbeat who could feel his breath. That's how close John had become to Jesus. They were, in a sense, the best of friends. Do you have anybody that you're that close to? The hymn writer Fanny Crosby, blind almost since birth, was so close to Jesus that she wrote over 8,000 hymns about him. Wrote them in the latter 19th century and into the 20th century. One of the ones she wrote that a lot of you know is close to thee. Then we come to this morning's reading from the 19th chapter of John. It starts, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, Standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, 
here is your son. And then he said to his disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, it's written, the disciple took her into his own home. The closer to Calvary Jesus got, the fewer disciples there were. Where were the blind men that Jesus healed? Where were the deaf men that Jesus healed? Where were the lepers that were cleansed? Where was Lazarus who was raised from the dead? No one was at the foot of the cross watching him die except for a handful of devoted women and the disciple whom Jesus loved. The same one who knelt by the cross was the one who sat by his side. Where were the others? You know the hymn. Where were were you there when they crucified my Lord? Sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. How it must have helped Jesus to look out in agony and see the face of John. And John, because of his closeness, had the privilege of taking the mother of Jesus home with him to care for her and live with her as her son. Can you imagine the conversations they would have over the years to come talking about the life they had had with Jesus? Can you imagine what it, what it was like for John to stand beside Mary at her bedside when she died? Oh, those moments when you have drawn close to Jesus. When we're kneeling at the foot of the cross, Jesus does this amazing thing. He gives John and Mary and all of us clear instructions. From the cross, with His words, Jesus offers up His last will and testament, His parting instructions of life after his death. It's Jesus' estate plan, if you will. He shares instructions for executing his family trust. He offers his last will and testament, and it's unlike any will and testament we might put together or inherit. Because Jesus' will and testament had nothing to do with his investments or his assets, his property or family heirlooms. It had everything to do with relationships. Instead of leaving something for his mother and John, he leaves them with each other. He says, woman, here is your son. And then he says to the beloved disciple, here's your mother. In his dying breath, Jesus gives his mother a new son and to John, he entrusts a new mother to care for and support. As he dies on the cross, Jesus entrusts the life and welfare of one another, of each of us, to his followers. And what's more, he places upon these new relationships the value we reserve only for our closest family. No longer are we to depend solely upon our own flesh and blood to define our family, for we, all, for we are all to be family for one another by the grace of Jesus Christ. Jesus creates within the world a new understanding of family. No longer will our first loyalty be to our own tribe or nation or clan, because whoever does the will of God now becomes our mothers and sisters and brothers and fathers. Remember the story from the Gospel of Mark in the third chapter? A crowd was sitting around him, and they said to Jesus, Your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. And he replied, Who are my mother 
and brothers. And looking at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. From the cross, with John and Mary, we sense our own estate plan. This new expanded family that will have eternal consequences. Through them, Jesus creates this new community that will last forever. It gives us a new mission to reach out and greatly expand our family. To reach out to our neighbors, to the widow and orphan, to the outcast, the stranger, to the poor, and the least of these, as Jesus would call them. Our 505 vision is part of, really, our last will and testament. To exclude our neighbor and those on the outside looking in is to run the risk of excluding Jesus himself. Those of us who are just still getting replenished from this Belize mission experience, uh, we acutely understand that and found it in just seven to ten days working within the framework of the fruit of the Spirit, our theme, where we felt a sense of family and kinship that we would want to last forever. It's the reason why so many people that go can't wait to go back again, to get that Belize fix that comes out of this feeling of expanded family through the family under God. I want to show you a few quick slides to give you an idea of the, what I'm talking about. The first one is of this church. This church was a dream almost 30 years ago of a small village called Concepcion. They laid a foundation and, and couldn't get the resources and the energy to go any further, and it just sat dormant for almost 30 years. And then something welled up within the people. God's dream uh, gained a, a new foothold. And within the last couple of years, this hurricane shelter, too, because it's concrete block, and a central meeting place uh, started to take form. And as you look at the next picture, you see how we arrived. And one of the things we did is we put a coat of paint on the inside. There'll be tile floors that'll be put down. And the next one shows the place painted now. And the day before we left, all of the children, some 150 of them, gathered in to say thank you to us. I'll talk more about that later. And then for even you Belize team members, right after we left, look at the next picture, we have windows that have already been put in, purchased by, from our mission and from all of you. And doors will come next, and there, we hope maybe there'll be a dedication this summer. When God puts a dream within us, and it's a godly dream, it, it can never be wiped out. We worshiped every morning at, in this next picture at a, a fellow's house by the name of Alario Avilas. And uh, Alario has a nice place, one of the nicest uh, homes in the San Narciso area. And he has a front porch, a veranda that extends outward. And so it's all, the rest of it's on, uh, there's a little side porch and we're in the open air and we could hear the birds sing, and the, and the freshest, freshness of every day as 27 of us would sit and eat breakfast and, and then worship uh, together. Alario, on our last morning there, tearfully, as he said goodbye, he said, when I built this house 20 years ago, God put the image of this front porch on, our, on my heart. And I wasn't really sure why I built it. It's been nice for the grandkids. He says, until the last couple of years when you've been here and you've worshipped here. He said, that's why God told me to do it. The real reason that we come down in just the next few pictures uh, 
is for this reason. The tenderness of children. This is Lindsay McPhail. And the next picture is of Jessica Rice. And the next picture is of Greg Cook. And then Ashley Granger. And then yours truly. It's amazing how the kids just swarm around you. And the next one's of Marissa McPhail. And I love this next picture is of Freeman Griffin. He was amazing with a saxophone. And here's a little boy with a toy saxophone <laughs> trying to mimic Freeman. And the next one is of Rich Johnston with our beloved Nell. And the last one, it's hard to see, but that's the beauty of this picture. There was an African-American police officer named... Terry Perdue from Dayton that was with us, a muscular guy. And the kids fell so in love with him, he's sitting on a, the step right outside the church. And so many kids have swarmed around him on our last day there that you couldn't even see his face. They were just loving on him. That's what it means to, to, to um, have this new expanded family, this new community with a mission that unites us with Jesus, causing us to do things that He did throughout His earthly ministry. And Jesus entrusts this responsibility to us from the cross. It fulfills the promise He made at the beginning of John's Gospel. He says, to all who receive Him, this is John writing, who believe in His name, He gives power to become children of God, who were born not of blood or of will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. Through Christ, in Christ, we become one family. Our family expands all the time. Remember, we're trying to mirror heaven. And heaven is going to be such a glorious place where we're going to be with so many people that we will celebrate life for eternity. As John and Mary watch Jesus die and turn toward each other, this family is realized, and we inherit our new way forward in light of the cross. The story at the foot of the cross reveals what the church, the church, could look like at its best, what Bethel could look like at its best. Through John and Mary, Jesus conceived and made possible a new community with the widest embrace all that you'll find in all the world. It creates a community that won't be restricted by bloodlines and surnames, but only by the grace of Jesus Christ. My hope today is that we can become this kind of a community for one another, for our neighbors, and for the world. It's our estate plan, friends. It's our last will and testament given to us by the Lord Himself as he hung and we watched him die. Amen.